You know, as we step out of 2020 and into 2021 and you see the pages of the calendar go into another year, another time, I I like to stop and think about time. Time's an interesting thing, isn't it? It's a mysterious thing. All of us have been allotted a certain amount of time. We just don't know how much time we've been allotted. And that's the crazy thing about time. Last Sunday, I was here, and early in the first service, uh, no, at second service, my wife called and said, hey, my, my car won't start. And, of course, I immediately blamed her and said, well, you left the lights on or you left the door open. You know, men are really good at blaming their wives, and I probably am um, really better than most, I think. And, but anyway, I, I rushed home from the service in between the announcements, and I, I uh, picked her up, came back, and then Monday... I jumped the car and just drove it around, you know, thinking, okay, I'll drive it around, I'll charge it up. And I've, I haven't done this in probably five or six years, but I pulled into the little cemetery off the side of 98 here in Gulf Breeze. And I left the car running, I got out, and I just began to, to walk around. And I have a lot of friends and relatives who are buried in that cemetery over the 37 years that I've been pastoring the church, I've done a lot of funerals. And so I'm walking around, I see, um, well, there was a young man named Chris Zinn who helped me start the church back in 1983. He was one of the three guys, me and another guy named Roger and, and Chris, knelt on the edge of this property when it was just a bunch of pine trees. And he was the one who prayed. And after we prayed, he stood up and said, I feel like the Lord spoke to me. I said, well, Chris, what did he say? He said, I believe God wants to make this a beachhead for many people to come to the Lord. I said, well, it's not on the highway. It's not visible enough. He goes, well, I just know what the Lord said. And so we bought the property at that time. It was just five acres. And we began to build our first building. Well, Chris, who lived four doors down from me at that time in Tiger Point, he got cancer. And before we even got the building up, he passed away. He's buried right over there and died in 1984, right over there in the little cemetery. My brother who passed away in 2011, my mom, my stepdad, and I could go on and on and on. And as I was walking through the cemetery, I thought, wow, the passage of time. And how much time do you have, John? I'd ask myself. And I wonder, you know, if you ever stop and think about time and how precious it is. The Apostle Paul did. I I want you to think about this picture in your head. There's a guy in prison. He's about to be, well, really he's about to be violently executed. And so he pins a letter. He pins a letter to a young friend of his, a son in the faith. Of course, it's the Apostle Paul and his young mentor or mentee, Timothy. And here's what Paul says. He says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. And finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. The Apostle Paul recognized time. And when he got to the end of it, he said, I've fought the good fight. He he pictured himself, I think, as a boxer. Uh, You know, he fought the fight. He's finished it. And he feels like he's, he's accomplished God's purpose in his life. He says, I, I finished the race. Like a runner, man, he's, he feels like he's breaking through that, you know, finish line. He's won the race. It's over. And he says, I kept the faith. And the word for keeping the faith is that of a steward who watches over someone else's stuff. He said, I, I kept what God gave me to do as a boxer, as a runner, as a steward. Now, now let me have your attention. Here's a man facing death. He doesn't lose heart. He's not hopeless. He doesn't feel like he's living without purpose. He's not depressed. He's not fearful. 
He knows his life had purpose and that he ran the race and his time has come. Now, let me ask you a question. Wouldn't you love to say that at the end of your time? To be able to say, you know what? I fought the fight. I didn't wander off. I didn't stagnate. I didn't give up. I didn't quit. I I kept the faith. So, So how do you do that? How do you come to the place in life, whenever your time is, I don't know, you don't know. How do you come to the place where you can say and not lose heart, hey, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. I I think Jesus gives some great instruction on that. And I just want to read some of his words. And, And I want you to listen because I think he gives us some great instruction on how to finish well. Listen to this is the voice and the words of, well, maybe not the voice, but the words of Jesus. Come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And that word rest has a sense of fulfillment and purpose. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. I'm gentle, lowly in heart. You'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. These are powerful words for the heart. Great instruction for the soul. And I want to highlight three words here in this message that Jesus speaks to us about finding purpose, fulfillment, and ability, and the opportunity to live for him and in him. He says, come, take, and learn. Come, take, and learn. Come to me, all you who are weary, heavy laden, or burdened. Maybe you're here today, and you say, John, I'm I'm burdened or I'm, I, I don't have rest. Uh, I, I shared this story first service. Uh, you know, rest is, a, is such a needful thing. My daughter and her husband have been with us since Monday, and they've got a one-year-old and a, a three-year-old, just turned three. And so I've become w- well aware of the word rest. It's a, it's a very interesting word. And they went down to Destin with some cousins of my daughter's to spend the night the other night, and we kept the... Well, it was their, their anniversary was New Year's Eve. So we had the, the two little ones on New Year's Eve. And they get up really early. I'm talking like 4.48. Not that I look at the clock at all. <laughs> but it's early. But they go to bed kind of early. So you're in the midst of that time from 4.48 till, say, 7.30 p.m. You're like, come, Lord Jesus, our come bedtime, right? So it's, it's New Year's Eve, bedtime arrives, and there's the bath, and there's the washing, and there's the brushing the teeth, and then there's the milk, and then there's the rocking, and the story about the little blue truck, and you know, all of that. And then you get them in bed. And then, it's New Year's Eve, you have demonic neighbors who are shooting off fireworks <laughs> all around your house. And it's raining, All those who labor, maybe you're here today and you don't have that kind of issue, but maybe life itself, you're you're not at rest. Maybe it's because of people or relationships or decisions or problems or elections or masks or the bridge, whatever it is. He says, come and I will give you rest. Now, I want you to stay with me. This is an amazing instruction for Jesus of how to finish well, how to have purpose, and how to live in a way where you fulfill his purpose in life. Come, he says, come to me. I can make your life purposeful. I can lead you to what you were designed to and what your soul desires. This is a very personal promise and a very personal invitation to you and I, where Jesus says, hey, come to me. And it's Jesus who's saying it. Probably more than any other person in human history, Jesus had a race to run that was extremely difficult. Probably more so than anyone would ever run one. He came, the Bible says, to seek and to save the lost. To to reconcile you and I, mankind, 
people to the Father. His mission, his race was personally to bear the consequence of sin and to be a sacrifice for all mankind, to take upon the sins of the entire human race. I mean, what a mission. What, what, a, what an impossible mission, it seems. This, this was his purpose. This was his assignment. And the night before his death, in John's Gospel, chapter 17, verse 4, I want to just show a verse to you. It says, he's praying. He says, I've glorified you on the earth. And then he says this, I have finished the work which you've given me to do. What an amazing thing to be able to say. Knowing his time was at hand, like the Apostle Paul, he goes, hey, I finished it. I accomplished your purpose in my life. Not long after that, you know the story. He's arrested, he's tried, he's condemned, he's crucified, he's hung on a cross. And as he's hanging on the cross, it gets dark. The sun disappears. And he bears the guilt of sin, absorbs the wrath of God for all those who will believe in him. The darkness ends, and Jesus cries out in a loud voice. Remember what he says? It is finished. I did it. I ran the race. I fought the fight. I kept the faith. And I entered into eternity. In his life, greater than anyone could ever imagine, especially Tom Cruise, he had mission impossible. And he was able to proclaim mission accomplished. He finished it. He entered into the rest and to the glory of the Father. So he says to you and he says to me, come. I'll show you how to have rest, how to not lose heart, how to finish well, how to fight the fight and enter into God's purpose and into his rest and into his favor. Because you and I only have so much time to do that. You don't know how much you have. Jesus finished his race, his purpose, and he says to you, to me, come unto me, the risen Lord, and I'll give you rest. With your brokenness, with your failures, with your faults, with your hang-ups, with your insecurities, whatever it might be, with your problems, come to me just as you are, but come to me. In, in this great invitation, he says, come, but it doesn't end there. But a lot of people seem to end there. Okay, I, I came to Jesus, but, but there's more to the verse. It's like some people don't read the rest of it. And they never seem to fulfill God's purpose or, or really even run the race. Well, I just got saved. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And then he goes on. He says, and take my yoke upon you and learn of me. If you're going to complete his purpose without losing heart, without growing apathetic, without giving up, you must also not only come to him, but you must take his yoke. You say, well, John, what do you mean? Well, Jesus is painting a picture in their minds of, of an ancient practice and maybe even goes on in a lot of countries today where they would yoke animals together with a yoke around their necks so that they wouldn't drift off, so they wouldn't wander, that they would plow together. And Jesus says, look, I want to be yoked with you. I want to be partnered with you. And that, that, that you, would, you would not drift off or wander off and do your own thing. He says, come to me, but be yoked to me. Fulfill my purpose in your life. Stay with me. You, you move and you pull and you go in the direction that I'm going. Don't pull against me. Don't just try to do your own thing because you came to me. See, the picture that Jesus is painting for you, for me, for them, as he says this, is come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, take my yoke. The picture is one of obedience. That's what he says. Come to me. And not just come, but obey me. See, if you walk in obedience, you'll complete God's purpose, his plan. Here's what he's saying. You're a believer. And if you're walking in disobedience, going your own way, well, you're just going to drift. You're just going to wander. You're not going to fulfill my purpose in your life. You're not going to be able to say, hey, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I, I kept the faith. Remember God's people in the Old Testament? 
during the time of, of Moses being born and, and, and how they were trapped there in Egypt and eventually became slaves. I mean, think about the word slave. There's no rest. There's no fulfillment. Seven days a week you labor. No Sabbath. And God hears their cry and he comes and delivers them to himself. And he wants to lead them into his purpose, into his rest, which he calls the promised land. And so in obedience, they go. And they arrive at the borders and they send some spies in. And you know the story. They come back, most of them, and say, what are you kidding me? We can't go in there. We can't fulfill this purpose. We came to you, but there's no way we can go into this land. There's giants. We don't have the resources. We'll be defeated. And they lost heart. And they turned around, went back into the desert, and they wandered and they drifted their entire life. They came to the Lord, but they weren't obedient to the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 3, it says, Therefore I was angry with that generation. They always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my way, so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter into my, my rest, my purpose, my plan. You have people who come to the Lord. They're delivered by the Lord. They, they get saved, and, but they're unwilling to take the yoke of obedience. They want His promise. They want His blessings, but not yoke themselves to the Lord in a way to follow Him in obedience kind of into the land that He has for them. Let me ask you a question. Don't you want God's purpose for your life? Don't you want his favor, his hand his, his, on your family, on, on, your, on your relationships? Are you willing to kind of take the yoke of obedience? Say, okay, Lord, I'll trust you with that. Maybe God's spoken you, to you in your life all through this time since you've come to him about certain things. And you've just been unwilling to be obedient. God says, look, I, I want to talk to you about your money and how you spend it or don't spend it. I want to talk to you about lust, about what, what you allow yourself to dwell on and go to and pursue. I want you to be yoked with me, he says. I want to talk to you about your unwillingness to be humble or gentle or meek like Jesus says he is. He says, I, want, I want to talk to you about being yoked. The Israelites spent 40 years wandering and drifting and producing nothing for the Lord or fulfilling his purpose. They died in the desert. They died that way, unfulfilled, never entered the land. If you come to Christ, he says, take my yoke of obedience. Take it. Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 are all about the church and people coming out of their old life into a new life and fulfilling God's purpose and plan in their life by being yoked to him. In chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, it says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily, while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You come to the Lord, and, and then you harden your heart. He can't speak. He can't guide. He can't lead. In verses 14 and 15, it says, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold to the beginning of our confidence, steadfast to the end, while it says, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart as in the days of rebellion. You say, well, John, are, you're not talking about salvation by works. No, I'm talking about you come to him, you're saved. But are you willing to be yoked to him and find his purpose and passion? Hebrews 4, verse 11 it says this, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. And he's talking about those Israelites wandering in the desert. Not salvation by works, but I will say this, true faith always demonstrates itself in obedience. It just does. It demonstrates itself. Come to me, he says, and take my yoke upon you. Have a life that doesn't wander, that finds rest, that finishes the race, that doesn't lose heart, that fulfills his purpose. That's what he's saying. 
When you yoke yourself to Christ, he shares the load. He helps. He pulls with you in your job, in your marriage, in conflict, in parenting, in all the difficulties that come. Lord, I want to be yoked with you. I want to be following your path. You might think at first, well, John, that means I have to change my lifestyle. I have to give up some habits. I have to do some things. But after you yoke yourself to him, say, okay, Lord, I'll be obedient. You'll be walking with him, and some of the things you used to wander off into, you won't. And pretty soon you'll look back and you go, wow, there's a field being plowed, and there's fruit coming up. It's amazing what God is doing. He's doing it. I came to him. I'm yoked to him. I'm obedient to him. I'm finding his purpose. I'm entering his rest. And, and then he says one more thing. Look what he says there. Not only come to me, not only take my yoke upon you, but he says, learn from me. Learn from me. Let me teach you, Jesus says. Let me show you what's valuable and significant to me, to the Father. See, I, I have two sons. And they're both grown now. They both have their own kids. But I remember when they lived in the house with me. And as I got older, I started buying basketball goals. I tried to get them in surfing, but that didn't happen. We played a little tennis, but they liked basketball. I never was really a great basketball player, but I thought, hey, if I'm going to connect with these two guys, i got to put a basketball goal out in the driveway. So I put one out in the driveway, and we love playing horse and pig and 21. And, of course, I always won. That's what was so much fun about it. But then they started getting older. And I mean, I had an unblockable hook shot to this day. <laughs> but, but I never played organized basketball. I didn't know, you know, the, 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 the way that you were supposed to block people out. I didn't know the plays. And, and so we loved to play uh, 21. And I can distinctly remember, even though I was passionate, even though I was determined, I remember when those two boys started beating me in 21. And I thought, how in the world is this happening? Well, they, were, they, they had all these moves, they, they had these plays. They, they ganged up on me in 21, and I can remember I used to go in the house and Lynn would go, who won? I'd go, who won? Who, what do you, who do you think won? And I would go in and I'd be very quiet. I don't know, I think it was a tie. <laughs> and even though I was passionate, even though I, I, I was committed, I never really learned the game of basketball. There's a lot of people who come to the Lord, they're very passionate, they're very committed, but they never really learned his lifestyle. See, here's the thing. It's, it's one thing, yes, we teach Scripture, and that's important. We, we, we want you to know doctrine, sure, to, to, to understand theology. But Jesus wants also to understand lifestyle, application. See, I bet most of you, if you're believers here today, you'd say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Great. I believe in the resurrection. I believe that God loves me. I believe in, in the Trinity. I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe in the second coming. But what difference does that really make at work with the people you rub shoulders with every day, how you treat them and how you see them and, and, and what the Lord may wants to do through you for them or with them? about your attitude and interaction with people around you, your neighbors. Oh, I believe God is sovereign. And why are you so fretty and worry all the time? What are you so upset about? Well, why do, you know, financial challenges and sickness and, and, and elections and things like that make you so crazy? Oh, I believe God is sovereign. But have you learned from Jesus how to walk that out? See, we need to learn from him. If someone tells me, yeah, I'm a believer, I'm yoked to Jesus, I'm learning of him. You know, when you look at the life of Jesus and he says, come, learn of me. And you never serve, you never give, you never sacrifice, you don't forgive others, you don't walk in humility. I, I ask myself, 
are you sure you're learning from Jesus? Because that's the kind of lifestyle he had. Every time I read about him, he was serving, he was giving, he was sacrificing. He, he, he was involved in, in washing feet, I think. And then that's, you know, it's, you mean it's not all about me? No, listen to what Jesus says. He says, do you want to finish the race? Do you want to fight the fight? Do you want to, you know, keep the faith? Then he says, first of all, you got to come to me and get gloriously saved. And he can do that. And it'll turn your life around. You change from the inside out. And then he says, you've got to yoke yourself with me. You've got to learn to be obedient, not do your own thing. And then finally he says, you've got to learn life my way, not your way. I, I don't know how much time I have. I don't know how much time you have as we step into this new year. 2020 has been crazy, and here we go. But I want you to hear this this promise and this personal invitation from Jesus as you step into it, because I want my life, your life, our life to be able to say, you know what? I finished this race. I fought this fight. I kept this faith as a good steward. I didn't just do my own thing. To, to be able to, to pass it on to a young Timothy or whoever it might be, because Jesus says to you and me, come, yeah, believe. Believe. Take my yoke, obey, and learn life my way, not your way. And you'll find rest, and you'll find peace, and you'll find purpose, and you'll be able to finish the race well. You know, I had, we had a Bible study a year or so ago in a, a men's study over in the coffee house, and we used this book by Steve Farrar called Finishing Strong. And I had a doctor friend who was attending that, um, that Bible study. I had known him for a long time. I did his wedding. Uh, he was a well-known ER doctor here in the Baptist Hospital. In fact, I think he established the light flight where the helicopters would come in and, you know, take people back to the hospital. In fact, they landed two of the helicopters out here when we did his funeral. Well, he was going through that, that study with us, and he had just retired. Bought an RV, went on a trip, came home, and was sitting in his house with his wife watching the Tour de France, the bicycle deal. And she was washing the clothes, getting dinner ready. And she went over to let him know dinner was ready. He tapped him on the shoulder. He was gone. He died sitting right there, just retired. Worked his whole life in, in the medical field. And, and i never forget the funeral and found out that he enjoyed that Bible study so much and his heart was to finish well that she took the book, finished strong, and laid it on his chest and was buried with it. I thought, wow. And, and it made me think and, and, and about the passage of time and also this whole thing of I fought the fight, I finished the race. And he says, there's laid up for me I love the way he's, that Paul says this as he writes to his young son in the faith. He says, finally, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only to me, but all who will love his appearing, those who've been faithful. So as we step in this first Sunday of 2021, my challenge to myself and to you is let's fulfill God's purpose in our life. Let's don't grow apathetic or lazy or, or drift off or think God doesn't have the resources to accomplish what he wants to accomplish in my life. Let's finish the race. Let's fight the fight. Let's keep the faith. Come, take, and learn. Amen?